liquidation. We're doing. We're working on the attic right now. We don't get all the rooms right away, but we're working on the attic. <laughs> well, what is the date today? Seventh. Seventh. So I don't have no idea. I always have to ask. Well, as we say, it's seventh of July, 1994. States. Brought to you by the Little Brother Information Network. Big Brother is watching, and Little Brother has a big mouth. <laughs> That's our unit motto. We've been traveling all over the country, um, busy to the point where we do kind of lose track of days. Since last you probably heard us, uh, we've been in the Dakotas, Montana, Texas, Florida. We've been into the East Coast. We've been uh, up north to our own state of Michigan, meeting, meeting with a lot of our new regimental strength militia units, which are organized. I don't know, I might have a sample of one of the news articles. They actually covered it in the news. Now, I'm not going to say it was derogatory, <laughs> okay, to a certain extent. But they couldn't deny it because what's happening up in the upper parts of Michigan, uh, for instance, around Petoskey, Brutus, um, near uh, Traverse City, is uh, the 1st Wolverine Regiment, which is overt, organized, has been meeting on the Village Green. They meet in the town parks. They get permission. The mayors are backing this up. The county is not giving them any problem. The sheriffs have been told and have explained exactly what their intentions are. They're meeting on a regular basis. New units are being formed virtually every week. We will have three new overt regimental units probably within the next month. Regiment strength and truly regiment strength. But they don't bring their weapons to the... They bring their weapons also. They do, they do bring their weapons. This is yes. a weapons meeting. Yes. It's drill and training yes. on the village green. The mayors know about it. The town, the town police know yes. about it. The county knows about it. The only ones that are whining about it is the state police. We all know why. Weapons and so regiment. So regiment, uh, we're looking in our case, uh, they're looking at three battalions. Each battalion about 600. So we're looking at, a, at an under, like a light regiment right now, the way they're set up. Now we don't have weapon sections for these units yet, but others do have heavy weapon sections. Artillery, armor, mechanized forces. So we need to do that here. <laughs> well, it depends on your area, and remember that that's organized militia, or not, well, it's not organized, it's regimented uh, militia at large, and you still have should have as many militia at large formations as you can. Militia at large could be a platoon, a squad, five men who get together on a regular basis, as high as maybe a company, but if you start to get that large, which is about 120 to 140 men, I would recommend making a whole new unit. You're better off doing that. Number one, KISS, keep it simple, stupid. No bureaucracy. Your administrators are also your fighters. All people are allowed to participate. All ages are allowed to participate. As long as rigor mortis hasn't set in, put wheels on them. Okay? That's right. That's how it works. The reason I say that is that for every man or woman who may be older who can't run in the woods, that's a person who can drive a truck, that's a person who can feed a soldier, that's a person who can run a radio, that's a person who can deal with logistics, and that means that that other man who would have been there is out in the field fighting. Okay? So we're concentrating on fighting units. That's one of the disadvantages that unfortunately a larger bureaucratic military has that is that they require all this baggage that goes along with them. You're not projecting your strength outside the United States. You're an indigenous combat force, and for that reason, you must you must plan accordingly. And you are a local militia. Remember, you may project your strength eventually down the road, but your first concern is this piece of real estate. <coughs> We've been very happy with the way things have organized. In Florida, the regimental strength units are now number 27, and their regiments are different, are organized larger than ours. Uh, in Montana, everybody knows and has seen a lot of what mom's done. They're very successful. They're branching out to the other states. There's a new tri-state operation taking place separate from that, which is going to include virtually, I'd say, tens of thousands of personnel by the time it's done. Florida militias uh, are in contact with virtually everybody that we know of so far. Georgia has expanded and is, is presently moving very quickly. I don't know how many of you heard about this. This was in gun week two weeks ago, but we had confirmation on this the week before. Three counties in the panhandle of Florida have passed overt militia laws. In other words, the counties will create militias of their own. They are five other counties that are in process, so we think we'll have one quarter of the state of Florida within the next few weeks. In other words, eight counties will have militia laws, whereby the county will directly support the militias in whatever way is necessary. They're also looking at a passe comitatus law, <clears throat> for the county, that already exists, but what they're going to do is implement it. What that means is that every able-bodied man 
will be part of the posse. And if need be, can be called forward to participate with the county to protect against the Fed if the Fed attempts to confiscate the arms. Excellent. Two, two, two sheriffs have already announced that they will refuse in every way, shape, or form to allow the Fed in to attempt confiscation of arms, period. So we've got good men and women out there. What they expect or what they need to do is what we, we told everybody. It worked exceptionally well. I'm really happy with this. That's really why we did the tapes. Okay, we were involved with this covertly long, long before we were involved with it overtly. What we saw, and I think all you can see this, is that you've got a lot of good military people out there who took an oath. But they do not know who to turn to. Mm -hmm. They cannot trust their management because their management has betrayed them. And they know this. They think they're alone. They think they're alone. That's the most common thing that I've heard. I've heard this time and time and time again. I've had men cry because, in fact, they've talked for two hours to us. Where they, they come forward and say, I did not believe the American people had any idea what was going on. That's now changed. The best weapon we have is to do it from below and work your way up. What do they say about uh, rear ends and alligators yeah. as the water rises? Well, that's what's happened to the other side. And because we started out with grassroots and came up from below, they had no perception we were there until it's too late. No countermeasure that they can, they can effect is going to stop us, period. If they admit we exist, and that's what they're trying to avoid at all costs, if you'll notice, they don't even talk about you on TV, do they? They don't acknowledge that you're even breathing. The reason for that is the first rule about, about any type of operation like this is deny the enemy airtime on the airways because that offers positive intelligence. They don't want to give you any idea of how many of us are out there, and they also don't want to acknowledge that you're you're bleeding them to death with all these little you know, jabs and pokes and barbs, and you are. We've done more damage as small, effective guerrilla forces than we ever could have as a centralized as a centralized group coming together and simply trying to beat the snot out of them at eye-to-eye -eye level. It's not going to work. <coughs> they own the courts. We know that. What kind of damage have we done? I'm sorry. I guess. Okay, most mostly it's been the fact that we have gotten to the rank and file. That has been the best thing that can happen. Mm -hmm. The rank and file are the ones who pull the trigger. By getting to those people first and explaining to them, hey, you gonna shoot at mom and dad? You gonna shoot at your brother and sister? You got people here you live next to every day. You get out of the gas station, buy gas from a guy who's got a big NRA sticker in the back of his back of his pickup truck. You wave and smile at him every day. You're gonna gun him down when he says, I'm not gonna let you take my weapons. And all of a sudden they got you gotta force them to think. You better make it personal. You've got to make it very personal. Well, you're gonna shoot people when they say they're not gonna take you're not gonna let you take their weapons? Are you going to kill some of us? Because you better make up your mind. It's not going to be a maybe. It has to become a yes or a no decision. Because that's really all this is. This is now that we're past the, there's, there's no fence sitting. We want a clear line between enemy and friend. But will they be pulled out of this country? Well, the military will, they'll try to. In fact, you can see how they've orchestrated several actions and they're desperate. They're desperate to try and pull as many of our soldiers out as they can. I have an in-law training for the invasion in North Korea. They are going to invade the capital. They're not even defending South. And yep. he was he was said, I shouldn't be telling you this. Yep. And uh, I mean, he was just up here two weeks ago for a wedding and I happened to say, hey, are you ready to defend Seoul? And he goes, we're not gonna defend Seoul, they're history. They think that there's two atom bombs underneath the, in the tunnels right now anyway. Right. We're going me. right to the capital, and I'm in the second wave. Yeah, this is like, what, well, that's a good point. What this is like is the Arab, last Arab-Israeli war was simply a race to see who could butcher who first. Israel went, went across the canal to the top. I'm sorry, the Egyptians came across the canal to the top to the north. The Israelis cut another channel across the south, and both were headed, one was headed for Cairo, the other was headed for Tel Aviv. Yeah. Whichever flinched first decided where the war stopped. That's exactly what happened. It'll probably what will happen here. Now, the thing about Korea is Korea ties up a good portion of our Class A equipment. Yugoslavia, he is, in fact, he made a public announcement. I don't know if anybody saw this. It was also in letter form. It was in the media about supporting the Bosnian conflict. Supporting one side and specifically giving them arms. Now, that takes us out of the neutral category and puts us in the middle of something as a target. Now again, that will create a shooting war. The good part is this. They have tried everything in their power to get us up off our dead butts to try and go, oh yeah, we need to go to Mars now. Yeah. Or, oh yeah, we need to go to Korea. Nobody's doing it. You don't see people running down the street thinking, oh yeah, we gotta get a war somewhere. Instead, just the reverse is happening. They've done such a good job with the general population 
but they won't get up for anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I've noticed that. That's exactly the case. They won't get up for anything. So again, that particular group of people is not a threat. The only thing that's going to be a problem is when the time comes, if they're not willing to do anything for themselves now, they won't do anything for themselves later until things get really bad. They're logical. They'll perceive that we're the ones they can suck off from, basically, because they've been sucking off the government or already working with the system. Those people, your best bet is to use your best weapon, the best weapon you have available, the refugee. When the time comes, tell them the government has all the food and they're down the road over there. Mm -hmm. Let them tie up the enemy's roads. Let them tie up the, the enemy's medical support system. Let them tie up their resources. Let them eat their food. By doing that, that creates a massive logistics problem they cannot maintain. It is the first we the first weapon war is, of course, propaganda and terror. The second phase is the refugee. Always in every war. So once you get past that early phase with the refugees bouncing back and forth and running hither and yon, then you get into the real knockdown drag out fighting. But the refugee, it depends on how he's best used. We don't have the resources, we'll support everybody we can, but bottom line is they wanted to tell everybody they had the food, they had the goods, they had the resources. Anytime you run into them, there's a government post right down there. I'll bet you those guys got lots of food. They gave it to the Bosnians, they got MREs. Go try some, they're great. They won't have enough to feed them. We're going to go around food. fast. That's right. We're going, yeah. the food. I hear that they're feeding the refugees down there. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear about that? I just came down from there. Look, I look great, don't I? Hey. <laughs> and they gave me clothes, too. Boxers well, are clothes. That's the best thing to do. And again, it's going to be a matter of using the right weapon for the right place at the right time. Now, this makes it sound like a, it's inevitable that we're going to fight. I personally believe it is inevitable we're going to fight. Mm -hmm. The reason I say this is I've been around the country, they have spent too much in the way of resources and they are too deep into the nation. They also stated, <coughs> I'm categorically, excuse me, and I've got a letter here by the way that came from the DOD computer system. It is for the 4th of July weekend and you'd swear it was, a, it, all it has to do with the UN and New World Order. It has nothing to do, it doesn't talk about the United States. It talks purely about New World Order, United Nations, New World Order, United Nations. Taking the 4th of July and giving it new meaning. Mm -hmm. Remember, taking our anniversaries and turning them into something else for somebody else. <laughs> now, as far as the situation overall goes, absolutely, they've been pulling forces out. You're all familiar with the fact they're destroying vast numbers of small arms right now. Vast. It is no accident they would destroy the M1 rifle, the carbines. Those are all strategic reserve rifles. Some of the finest steel and weapons this country ever made are at this time, we're, we're actually got the guys on double time, I think, right now, or overtime, to destroy roughly 3,000 weapons a day. Now it's 1911-45s, 1903 Springfields, 22 caliber training rifles, and they've done tens of thousands already, and we understand they're going to do even more. M1 rifles, M14s, M60 machine guns, and Browning 1919 A4s, A5s, and A6s. <clears throat> By doing this, they will destroy available resource weapons that we would be drawing from. Especially if we actually have a, a general uprising by the, by the regular military. Those are strategic reserve weapons that are vital because you will not be able to produce anything in the first few years of the war. Whatever you have is most of what you're going to get. Okay? Now that comes to another point that we've been trying to stress with everybody. Just tactically, I want to touch on this. You throw no steel case or any case away that you shoot. When you go to the range, sweep it clean and put them just in cardboard boxes if nothing else. If you are reloading, you throw no component away. If it's a damage case, set it off to the side. Something will be done with it. When you extract primers, save them. Primers can be remanufactured. That is a manufactured item. 22 caliber rimfire cases. Save all of them because we're going to need jackets for bullets. There are formulas already, the research was already done. 22 caliber jackets can become 223 jacketed ball rounds. We can swage them, cast your own bullet, and you're talking about re refabrication, in fact, literally recycling. <laughs> I like that. Because the government will like that. Yes, recycling. How many special operations people are on our side? I think, and, and this is something interesting, you should bring it up. I believe that they tested the, the most of the special warfare and the special services over the last year, uh, as of say from January back, the way they did this is they everybody heard about the questionnaire where they asked them, would you be willing to shoot at American citizens? But in addition to that, they came forward to different special warfare units and said, will you train with Russian personnel? 
Hmm. We have a Spetsnaz unit here. You're going to train with them. They actually said, you will train with them. And troops refused. Now, the ones that refused, they got, they got a big X mark. Progressively, they'll be gotten rid of, or they'll be cycled out, or they, what they'll do is they'll shut the unit down and reorganize a new one over here, rising up from the old SF groups, for instance. Uh -huh. The original unit will cease to exist. Yes. While you're on the subject of reloading, <clears throat> all of you, if you see it, go to a flea market or any of these garage sales. We just picked up an antique propane or uh, white gas fired smelting pot yes. unit. It takes no power. You can reload in the field with it. You should all be keeping your eyes open for those babies because they're, if you can find it, it's worth it. Or, or melting lead. And they are powered, uh, any kind of like Coleman gas. <laughs> any kind of, any kind of propane, white gas, or uh, any type of self-contained, self-energized system should be saved. Heaters, uh, the uh, little cook stoves, any of the uh, Coleman lanterns even, because they can be converted over to create an energy source. And we can, we can improvise. <laughs> One thing about Americans, give us some tools, and we can do a heck of a lot with what little we have. So we need to acquire as many of the different components as we can. Another thing is like dyes. You may not have the die, you may not have the rifle that the dies are required for, for instance, in reloading. Buy them anyway if somebody's got them at a yard sale and they're cheap. Anything that's reloading components, any cases, any cartridges, any weapons parts, barrels especially. If you have a barrel, we can make, make a weapon. A gun, yeah. That's right. All you need is a barrel and something on the other end to go when it gets in there. Boom. So that can be fabricated. Um, anybody who, who right now is weak need. Oh, I think we want to sell our guns. Oh, we're going to yeah. get single barrel shotguns and they won't come after us. Yeah. Okay, so then they ban single barrel shotguns. What do you do? Everything can be. Oh, we'll get bows and arrows and we'll turn in our shotguns. And... Okay, fine. Next time somebody says that they're going to do that, buy their weapons. Okay? Why are you going to take the chance of a real problem there? Buy their weapons and be done with it. You'll get some nice firearms, you'll get lots of ammunition, and everybody knows that neither one of those are plentiful now. Ammunition, and I said this, I, I warn everybody, there's guys here that know me from a year ago, I stressed, buy all the ammo you can get. A year ago, AK-47, 762 by 39 ammo was 65 to $80 a case. What is it right now? 200 or 300 well, So in other words, or more. more. That's, that'd be good. So, yeah, 200 a case is about 270 yeah, 270 you buy it one time before it creates a noticeable risk? Well, actually, what we found is that across the country, I, I really don't think it's, it's uh, even as far as from personal uh, notoriety. Yeah. Well, I don't, don't think it's really relevant anymore because give you an idea, so many billion rounds are generated every year. And then so many hundreds, if not a billion rounds, are probably brought into surplus. Virtually everything in the system is gone. Yep. There, there are so many issues. people doing this. I mean, people don't really understand how far this has gone until you see it nationally. A case of AK ammo in Georgia is going for $600. And on the East Coast, like in Pennsylvania and over in Connecticut, it's going for about $400. SKSs have been as high as two, dollars $300 in some areas. And it's availability. Supply and demand is a problem. And also there's some profiteering there. But the, the sales west of the Mississippi have been so great that most shops simply do not have merchandise to sell. They don't have ammunition. We ran into a guy right here in Ohio. Uh, we were going down to one of your big powder dealers. Uh, name will not be mentioned. We were buying powder at uh, 96 cents a pound for heavy rifle and 50 caliber powder, which is what we're loading is mostly 50 caliber right? rounding machine gun. Two guys showed up. They wouldn't say anything. Had a, had a five-ton steak truck with them. Came in with ten thousand dollars cash. Bought. He gave him a list. He said, "We want this, 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 this." And he goes, "Do you have this?" "Oh yeah, yeah I got this." So he goes. So after he gets everything uh, figured out, he's got everything to the truck. So it's going to come to so much money. He goes, "No problem. We got that." He goes, "By the way, where are you guys from?" He goes. Well, I didn't want to say anything until we were done here, but we're from South Dakota. They drove two days straight. They said, there is no powder west of the Mississippi in any volume. You're the only person we can find in the shotgun news that had anything left. And we didn't want to, we, we'll, or we'll tell you now that you're the only one we know of. And so we're going to come back again if you have anything left. They've been purchasing like that on a daily basis. $10,000 in a five-ton truck, and it's gone. That's happening all over the country. So I don't think that our lesser quantities are as noticeable now. 
<laughs> I think we're in pretty good shape there because if, if you want to order lesser amounts, I actually order, I just say buy whatever you can. However you want to try and break it down, that's fine. ATF has always been watching the gun shows. We have, of course, the latest letters which state that they are now targeting the gun shows. That because of the Brady Bill, that's going to be their excuse. They are now going to make a tremendous effort to go after the shows. Now, we already know that because locally they've been trying to shut shows down. Right. And back to the South Dakota thing, real quick. Yeah. You said it was a state truck? Were you staying? No, not state. 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 Right. What they've done is they, what, the idea here was, okay, let's put it in perspective. They figured that they'd have enough, they'd be able to keep track of it effectively enough that they'd give us enough to get us killed, but not enough to win. They had no idea of the organizations that were out there. They had no concept that the people would respond because the Brady Bill was supposed to get everybody to throw their hands up in the air and, and hand their weapons over. Finally, it's going That to was the saved. test. Well, yes, that was the <laughs> test. But they declared it as uh, armor piercing handgun ammo. As handgun ammo, that's right. Well, that's. That's under the old argument that, of course, T uh, the Thompson Center has been making, uh, uh, Thompson, the Thompson Contender has been made in just about every caliber, including 308, but they haven't banned 308 yet. Mm -hmm. so every it's rifle not caliber. a semi-automatic uh, Well, it's still a handgun, though. Oh. That's what they're looking at. It's a handgun. Yeah. Back to the SEALs and the Special Forces. Uh, one, There was a rumor up through here that one of the SEAL teams refused to work with the Russians. They had some on-base problems, and somebody, one of the SEAL members, left base, was met across state line, and shot. Okay, well, there was an S that was Special Forces. We know the people were involved. And, but the rumor that got back here was that that's a great buying back through Special Forces, and it was kind of an awakening for the Special Forces. It went through the teams very quickly. What happened was, uh, and this is a little, about a year ago, a little under a year ago. It's been a year. Yeah, the uh, in the formation that took the formation was at uh, at Kennedy Center. They were brought in. They were told they were going to had a, actually had a Spetsnaz platoon there in front of them. the uh, unit commander and of course all of the see, the junior officers were there. They stated, "You will work with these personnel, with Russian personnel here in the United States." <laughs> to a man, the executive officer, the officer in charge, and all of the senior NCOs and the team members refused. They were put in lockup on base. Three of the, while they were locked up on base, I don't know if you're familiar with, with, with uh, Fort Benning and the way the new barracks are, of course, they're over in the old sandlot areas. While they were in lockup, the foreign personnel were allowed to change into civilian clothes. They walked out to the POV lot. They got into POV, in personally owned vehicles, not into military vehicles, in civilian clothes, and left the site. Now, after that, they let them out of lockup. The people they put in lockup included officers who were married. Mm -hmm. uh, NCOs and enlisted men who were married who were not part of the barracks. As soon as they got out, as soon as they got out of the building, several people made contact with other people. One of three people made contact off the base and called Chicago. At Chicago, our people, including two Ranger buddies who were with this person originally, made contact. The person had to leave. He left with his two daughters and his wife. They were in telephone communication with him until they crossed the Illinois line. That's where they lost contact with him. Within a two or three hour period, Illinois Highway Patrol, several other cars pulled them over. They were, the husband got out of the car and they shot him there at that location. But the wife identified at least one Illinois Highway Patrol car. The case is still under investigation. There's still been no story made. The family, the wife and the children were put in the Underground Railroad and we've had them bouncing okay. around for a while. But the ripple effect back through the Special Forces. Everybody heard. Yes. They know they shot one of their own. The yes. government mm -hmm. shot one of yes. their own. That's now, good. Is that a positive response for us? It's it's good in that it'll cut it'll it'll take the sheep from the rams and yeah. divide them up real quick. There we got to remember that there's a percentage of people out there, and it goes right back to what a friend of mine said about uh, just before they were planning the Rex 84 exercises that we were involved. He sat down one day after meeting the, he was stunned. But what he said was very was very credible and makes sense, and everybody I think can understand it. These people could care less, some of them could care less who they work for, provided they get a big paycheck and they got lots of excitement. As long as they're allowed to do what they like to do, and some of them like to do it a lot, then they won't care if it's a UN flag, the US flag, or any other flag that's flying overhead. Now, that's not true of all of them. And some of the most patriotic men that I've met are in special warfare elements. That's why they join, that's what they are, that's what they're about. Those men are in a totally different situation, but remember, they're getting rid of everything they can. They don't want trainers, by the way. I don't, I don't show. There's an interesting point here. 
Special Forces' original mission was to be able to go in and make a military, literally to make an army. They were trainers. That's why they had languages. That's why they had skills. That's why 12 men, 18 can walk in and build up a 600-man army. They don't do that anymore. They want higher order trained gun sites. That's all they want, gun sites. No question. The big thing right now everybody's heard about is dynamic entry. Dynamic entry means go in, kill everybody, even the hostages. Ignore everybody, everything other than kill, kill, kill. Identify whether or not you have any wounded on your side. Collect all intelligence data. Finish off any wounded and leave. That's dynamic entry that they're teaching local law enforcement right now. That's a fact. We've been to Florida. We've been to Montana, and in both cases, we had police officers come forward. They are teaching them dynamic entry in Florida for even the local law enforcement. And then what's happening is MJTF police. <laughs> MJTF is coming in all the way down to the lowest level, and they are buying everybody that they can. They're trying to. Now, a lot of them are asking me, well, should we take their money? I said, yeah, don't take their weapons. Tell them you want money, and then go buy better weapons. <laughs> and more ammo, and then turn it around, because they're not going to go along with them, so they might as well arm themselves with teeth with the enemy's money. Heck with it. Makes more sense. <coughs> the only problem here is they're going to expect payment for, you know, for payment rendered, they're going to expect services. And so there's a great contest and a lot of conflict amongst the law enforcement people, too, right now. A lot of them simply don't want anything to do with it, and I understand that. So we're going to see quite a shift in the balance of, in the balance of power here very quickly. They're moving fast. Don't make any mistake about that. All you need to do is watch TV and even look at look at the newspaper. Things that they would never have said a year ago are in black and white print today. Now it took four years. You gotta remember how long we've been fighting this. I first brought up MJTF police over four years ago. We had people even the Patriot movement, all oh, there is now is that thing. I've got a letter that's probably in the briefcase, but they're talking about it nationally now. They couldn't hide anymore because as it's geometrically expanded, you can't put the kitty back in the bag. You know, kitty big, bag small. So when you can't hide it anymore, the only thing you can do is divert people's attention. Remember, whenever you're, there's two ways to defend against an attack, either stop it or divert the energy. Ring. That's what they've been doing. They're diverting the energy now. So MJTF is a reality. It's all over the nation. It will be the national police force. This is their way to create the national police force. MJTF was a covert arm that is now becoming an overt arm. The street gangs. I told everybody about this for the last two years. What have you seen in the papers now? They're even admitting and giving you the payroll amount telling you how much money they're paying the street gang members to be with the departments. This, of course, in lieu of the fact that before they said, well, we would never do that. Oh, no, we aren't doing anything like that. Boom, right between the eyes. Now, UN forces, are, we're in the same boat with that. The most recent thing we have is Fort Chafee. Anybody hear about that? Okay, now, we're gonna have to send the reports down here. We're gonna, just, we're gonna ship them down. We're gonna reproduce them, two different offices. We've got several different locations. Fort Chafee has, they ordered 5,000 uh, new mattresses, barbed wire, additional razor tape. They're stockpiling massive quantities of both. Where's Fort Chafee? Or Arkansas. Now, uh, yeah, interesting, perfect state. <laughs> Nigerian forces were in the downtown areas of the surrounding towns. They could not explain them away, and the Nigerian troops have stated uncategorically they are UN forces, and they are not there for training. There are three nationalities total that are on site. It is claimed now in the overt article, which we hope to have. In fact, if I go out west here in the next two days, we might have it in hand by Monday. They did a couple of newspaper articles that they contained locally, stating that these were going to be running detention camps at Fort Chafee for UN operations. They're overt about this. Then they tried to say, well, you know, we've got this Haitian thing coming up. Now, that cover story was blown by an announcement two days ago. What did they say? All individuals are going to go to Panama and are picked up from Haiti. Period. Any prisoners and any refugees. They aren't coming to the United States. So obviously what's happened is, they, again, we caught their old boot in the wrong trap, and now they're trying to figure out how to get out of it. This is also true of my, most, my favorite experience, and everybody's heard about it now, are the Russian trucks down in Mississippi. 
I run into three people who were who were uh, who were absolutely against the possibility that those things could be there. The last one was in Connecticut. He went down, talked to the people there. Well, what he is, he took pictures, and as he tried to leave, somebody came out of the compound and stopped him. You know, well, who are you? Well, who are you? Well, I work here. Who are you? Oh, well, I'm just taking some pictures of these things because I want to buy some. Oh, well, they're privately owned. He goes, oh, well, good. Who's the owner? I want to talk to him. Oh, uh, well, well, they're not really privately owned. They're government owned. Oh, well, they're government owned. Well, the government must want to sell them, right? What, what, what agency of the government owns them? Well, they're not really the government. It's the United Nations. <laughs> and it's like, oh, well, well, who's selling these things? At? Well, they're really not for sale. Well, wait a minute now. <laughs> so they're progressively, it's like a half truth, half-truth, half-truth, oh gee, finally square between the eyes. And of course the big concern is, well, why are you taking these pictures and where are you going with them? If there's nothing wrong and if everything's okay, why worry about photographing things? And I guess, uh, now again to remind you, there are 2,100 plus trucks on site. The most recent report that we have now, now they are moving the trucks by the way, but the most recent report we have from the stevedores and from the, the uh, longshoremen on the docks, the next shipment will all be armor. None of it will be trucks from this point out. So they're bringing in PCs and tanks, mostly T-72s. We have several photographs which we can send back up. We have flatbed uh, T-72s that are being run up 75 and down I-75 in Florida. Fortunately, it was an 85-year-old grandmother in a Taurus who had a lead foot that caught him. She was going the other way. And her granddaughter was with her, and her granddaughter knew what mom and dad said. She said, Grandma, we got to catch those trucks. So Grandma did a U-turn across the interchange and zipped down the road, and this thing was doing 85 miles an hour. They had to catch it. So not only did she do 85 miles an hour, but whatever was required in between, and she got some good rear-end pictures of these things going down the road in convoy. And they were all fully equipped T-72s. They were far and again exceeding the speed limit. Right now, I don't know if everybody's noticed this, but they're getting hard on the truckers. Yeah. Especially to travel over any kind of, any, any excessive speed at all. We've been driving six and eight hours and ten hours a day, one way on the road. There are trucks pulled over left and right if they're doing five miles over the speed limit. So the fact that these things are held bent for election, maintaining an 85 mile an hour speed limit on I-75 Florida is rather interesting because that highway right now is being watched like a hawk. Also, the stretch that they're on is being completely electronically monitored now. If you go down there, you aren't going to hear about it nationally, but you get a brochure at the rest stops talking about their new Wonder Electronic Highway. <coughs> we also have a couple of the Wonder Electronic blocks off the ground from there, too, by the way. So we're going to cut those open and find out what they look like. Hey, Mark. Yeah. I can introduce you to the man that made the originals without the electronics in, from Delaware, Ohio. Huh? He didn't make a dime on them. It was for a company. But he's here. He, no, he's not here tonight, but he was shocked. When I relayed the story, I got two channels about the F1 and every every fifth one, roughly. Yes, fifth to sixth one is it with a computer. State. He was shocked. But it made sense. Yes, but he 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 designed the original. The pyramid blocks. Oh, well, we're talking about the little divider blocks, yep. the reflective ones. And they're he laying designed. them all in the Hawking Hill area. We noticed that they're all on the roads here on the way in the road that we came in on. Some look like they were beat out though. Yes. Something will be valuable to you. Um, we got pictures here, Betty did, of the cars in Rygate, Wyoming, with the UN, and I'm sure you've seen them, the colored photographs taken by mom up there. I did a little bit of fun. I worked nine and a half years on the railroad. If you can get a car number and know the yes. railroad it is on, call the bill of lading department at that railroad, and they will give you the whole pocket of goods. The manifest. For the oh, break down where it originated, who paid for it, where it was loaded, where it's going, arrival time, everything. Well, they'll find out who we are. I think they already know. No, who we the guy are. never asked me. I, I just called up and I said, I need a, a bill of lading on uh, DODX or DOTX 11998740. He goes, Oh, here it is. Originated Oceanside, is being delivered to Winnipeg. He says, as a Matter of fact, it's been unloaded as of this date. And it's in a siding in Great Falls, Idaho, right now. And I said, who was it billed to? And he ran it up and he said, ah, oh, interesting. He said, this was U.S. Army out of uh, Fort Benning, Indianapolis. Yeah, Fort Benning, uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. Georgia. No, uh, Harrison. Oh, Ben oh, Harrison. Harrison. Ben, ben Harrison. Harrison. Ben Harrison? Yeah. Harrison. Yeah. Benjamin Harrison. Yeah, we Harrison out of Indianapolis. Hey, PCs? The ones that we were just, the one, the... No, these are the ones that were on the right gate photographs in Wyoming. It originated, um, here's what's funny. Fort Benning is interesting. 
Yeah, yeah, this is right in the middle now. But uh, the thing that was interesting is it's loaded in Oceanside, which is just above San Diego, and it's sent across to Amarillo, then it transfers to another railroad and went up through Wyoming, and then in uh, uh, Dakotas it transfers over to the Canadian Pacific. And I know a little bit from my days on the railroad about how they route cars. And I asked the dispatcher there, I said, that's pretty damn odd routing, isn't it? He goes, yeah, that should have went right up the coast, he caught the Canadian Pacific, right at Seattle. And he said, that's wild. And I looked at it, and all you got to do is get a map out and realize that's the least populated area you could sit inside. People wouldn't be seeing what it was on the rail. There's been a lot of... Yes? Yeah. A report came out recently, the McIlvaney report, about a detention center being constructed at the Rickenbacker Air National yes. Guard Base. Soon after that, in our local newspaper here, a report came out about several homeless groups lobbying to use the old building at Rickenbacker for space for the homeless. Would that be the kind of correlation we're seeing nationwide? That usually, that's a cover. Usually, what we find is that's a cover story that they've used. We in Michigan have uh, Wordsworth in Oscoda. If you look at the state, it's located up here, parallel with the tip of the thumb. Mm -hmm. Okay, Wordsworth about a year and a half, two years ago, was was being uh, cycled out. It was supposed to be completely shut down and privatized. That was the cover story. All of a sudden, it fell out of the news after the original pieces were done. There are only two businesses in there. The old part of the base, the, the main part of the base where the B-52s were, is still sealed off. Now we have Ilyushins and a lot of other foreign transports moving into the area. We also have something that's been cropping up all over the country, white 747s with very few windows, though they have some left, and absolutely no markings on them, not even a tail number marking. We know where they originated from, and I'll send a copy of this to several of you that are here. We have the blueprints, we have the construction photos, and we have the final photos of a routing prison located in Oklahoma City. Across from the, from the prison, they have 747s. They're all white. They're, they're refabricating them there, reconfiguring them. That's the extermination camps. Well, what we think it is, yes, before, it's, it's, a, it's a final processing point for taking people to points and destinations unknown. The site looks like a massive pentagon. It literally looks like a fortress. Originally, the cover story was this was going to handle a handful of prisoners like Manuel Noriega. It's going to have one or two people, a small site, about the size of three or four houses. And when you have these maximum security people, they're gonna fly right into Oklahoma City and then from there out. All of a sudden, the configuration changed. And the, we have the blueprints, the, all, the, all the cells are triangular in shape. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not triangular, they're um, pyramidal in shape, okay? The number of cells exceeds 1,200. The number of people probably in a comfortable situation would be about 2,004 to 2,008. Realistically, you could cram probably 10 times that if you didn't worry about size. It is located right off the airport. It has a docking umbilicus to hook right up to 747s. It will accept any kind of aircraft, so the plane can fly up. The people will never even hit the ground. The whole gist of the way the system is going to run is you will be virtually, you'll be cell compartmentalized no matter what they do with you, no matter where you are. From the, from the wholesale end, which would be the 747s, or the retail end, which is using the helicopters locally. They do not want to see anybody repatriated to the population in any way, shape, or form. Extermination. That's, what That's right. They can't afford anything else. The 747s are showing up in all the western remote air bases that are, are supposedly closed down. Wordsworth has one that we know of. K.I. Sawyer in the Upper Peninsula. We had people who were saying, well, I'm not going to get involved. I'm going to run to the UP. Okay. Well, so one of our people who was going every two weeks to find property up in the UP goes across the Big Mackinac, <laughs> turns west on Highway 2, and comes across a column of military vehicles with black vehicles front and rear. So he pulls off the road and gets out. I'm a Vietnam veteran. Hey, what you guys doing? How are you? Oh, they started, they were talking to him. Well, we're going up to the, to the uh, air base. Well, that's closed down. No, it's not closed down. It's, it's going to become an international military facility. Now, we didn't have any information on this. Well, the black shirts wouldn't talk about what he said. Then he asked the important question, well, how many of you guys are there? Everybody turned their back and walked away. Gave the cold shoulder from that point on. They don't count higher than 10. Yeah, exactly. That's up. So what's going to happen is we're getting exactly what we expected. There is no surprise. They are concealing them. BMPs are being spotted. And in fact, I physically went to observe two 
rail, well, it was more two rail cars, but at least two rail cars that had been disgorged at a site in Rapid City. Uh, they had moved the equipment already, but the photographs we'll have in hand tomorrow, or probably Saturday while I'm gone, they were canvassed BMPs. But the silhouette is unmistakable. Anybody familiar with the Russian armor, it's not like anything anybody else has. And even if all you see are the tracks, that's enough to tell you exactly what you're looking at. They look to be BMP-2s. Now, that's fairly sophisticated, but I wouldn't mind having one. I'll have one after the war. It's like I always wanted a BTR-60, and I'll have one at the end of the war. I want a tool my own four, you know, eight-wheel drive, uh, you know, all-terrain vehicle with twin uh, Studebaker, uh, you know, diesels. It's my idea of heaven. That's right. It's a retirement. It's a retirement vehicle. So I've just got to have. It. I'll have one, but uh, a lot of these things are showing up in greater numbers constantly. Yeah, I have a question. Um, when, when you're out and about across all the states, now I've uh, usually from here to Indianapolis, I see these new towers, these light yes. towers. Okay, now what? Are, are they in all these states now? They're in virtually every state okay. we've gone to come across. A little across. different design, but they're all... Almost all identical. Yeah, well, the well, ones in India are a little black different. Black. They've got... No, they, oh, yeah, the antennas are different. Well, okay. that's probably the sending unit for whatever it is they've got upstairs. Now, is that microwave-generated uh, video cameras? Uh, because they figure, you know, we'll, uh, you know, cut the wires, the box is right there. Right. I think... We're not sure about that yet. Number one, the problem with microwave is that microwave is one of the battery weapons they're using. And I don't think that they're going to want to try and interrupt or clutter the clutter the field with a lot of excessive transmission. And why have the intent? Well, it's, it, could be, it could still be tight beam high frequency. Oh, tight beam high frequency. That's, uh, that's highly frequency probable. Frequency generated uh, right. power. Okay. That's, what I think, that's what I think they're going to be sticking with. The reason I say that is because the microwave technology that they have in hand, they plan on using because they assume we're so stupid we're not going to figure it out. is admitted that they'll offer you the technology to shut your car down. That's offered as part of the package now. You can pay the extra money for it and get it from anywhere in the city. You don't have to be right there to go click. Anywhere in the city they have to sell offer the service and it's in the car. It's already there on site. Can you explain that? Okay. Yeah, okay. Now, what we're looking at is, no problem. With the earlier technology, the first argument is common sense. A lot of the size, of te size and, and components in, in the existing auto, uh, electronic ignition, as opposed to the size of components, say, for the 70 series cars. Original electronic ignitions, when they first came out, were a box about so large, about so thick, everybody could unplug, snap, wait, whiz, bang, boom, and it was back on. That was actually late 60s to middle 70s technology, 73. solid state. Yeah. 73 production wise. Large, large circuitry, conventional solid state, with some very crude microchips. They weren't even micro, they were actually macrochips. We're now into the 80s and 90s. The electronic ignition has not gotten smaller, it's gotten bigger. Now certainly it's doing a few more functions, but when you consider what a single microprocessor does, and consider the simplicity of the automobile, there's no way in heck you're going to convince me that all the extra chips and technology we've thrown in have to do with simply controlling the system in the car itself. You need only compare the size of the 1973 module to the 1980 module. Some of the newer ones are vary in size from anywhere from one foot long to a foot and a half long. Cost what over up some up to seventy hundred dollars now, depending on which one it is. They break all the time. And they're and they are like all solid state, like all micro micro technology. They're very fragile, but. The point being that uh, we also uh, have been able to demonstrate with the IROC cars, for instance, that were done, that were high performance cars, they put a chip in the car without telling anybody. The chip <laughs> identified when the car was traveling at so many miles per hour, or in other words, the engine reached an RPM, of so many RPM for so many minutes. After seven minutes, the car would automatically shut down. It's like what? 86 grand national, yeah. 120, used to. Yeah, now what they did, now they even offered the used chip. To. Yeah, they offered a pirate chip you could buy to replace it. And a lot of guys made some big money on bonds selling that pirate chip, too. But the point is... Hyperdyne. Yeah, Hyperdyne systems. Not to be confused with Hyperdyne. It was uh, something like that, yeah. high performance. It was out of Florida. Yeah. The point is that that technology was incorporated without telling anybody, and the people paid for the cars cash outright. Of course, they were their property, but they didn't have any idea what was inside. Now, the EPA has promoted, as of three years ago, they were promoting to try and do it with all cars before 1983. That gives us a cutoff date when we can pretty well assume that all of the cars have been brought up to this particular technology, and there are indications that they have a shutoff, an EMP circuit. It's not that complicated. In fact, it's very straightforward and very simple. It's either an EMP-type circuit or it's some form of radio wave intercept circuit that would allow them to shut the vehicle down. 
We have more recent indications of this. We had an ambulance that was stolen in Detroit. It was not a special tech ambulance in any way, shape, or form, but after they found it, one of the comments that was made and was in a live interview is why it got out and then it died very quickly. They never repeated it. <coughs> but one of the officers said, oh yeah, we could have shut that ambulance down at any time anywhere in the city, but we felt it would be safer if it was moving because that way we could find it. So they admitted that uh, overtly that they were able to shut the vehicle down at any given time in any location. And of course, this is an example again of the type of technology on hand. Lojack has a variation on this already. And Lojack originally was a box about the size of this VCR right here. But Lojack is now a bit of technology that they can hide in any one of about, uh, I guess, 40 some different crevices of the car that's only this big. And will allow the track and shut the vehicle off anywhere they want, anytime they want. So that gives you an idea of the difference. And remember, another thing, if you're seeing this overtly on the market, that's old technology by comparison. There's so much more they can put into it now that it's ridiculous. Mark, yes. did you see the business card of an Air Force officer that uh, I had published in a little newspaper out of Kentucky called Tell It Like It Is? Mm -hmm. Did you see it? He gave it to me after a Second Amendment rally last summer at Dayton. We were all told to go to the sportsman's bar and grill, all of the big wigs and us little nobodies. And in came some officers in civvies. And they were getting mighty high, and we got to argue about <coughs> Linda Thompson, one threw his business card down, just this big, and on the top is a big C-130 with this crazy antenna structure on the tail, and his name and everything below. Well, we sanitized it, took everything off but Wright Patterson and the picture of the C-130 and published it in this newspaper. I said, what is that? It looks like the Golden Gate Bridge coming off the tail. He says, no, that's what we jam with. He says, I make the different boxes that we do different jobs with. And then when I got home, I got found out also they can be used to cook computer chips. And just a couple weeks ago, I learned that the young men who are operating this equipment have no OSHA protection. And some of them are in their early 30s, already are down with cancer. Yeah. They're right in the beam. But I wondered if you had seen this yes, it, that we had published. It gave, I didn't see it, but there's something that, this is what I was mentioning earlier, is that uh, technology. The helicopters we're dealing with, the newest helicopters, are fly-by-wire fly equipment. Microwave is a terrible thing when it's directed at a target. The cost for the tube is about $89. The cost for all of the other components is another $100. Then it's a matter of what power source you have, and the more money you have, the more power you have. If you point it at one of these aircraft, especially the fly-by-wire, you'll notice that they have a tendency to start doing things. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got the circuit for this, means? Mark? What? The technology, doesn't, the circuit is so simple, it's ridiculous. Well, where it's do we get? More than a directional, okay, electronic, okay. Well, hold on here, listen up. Not that we would ever do this. Of course, it would be for research purposes. I believe his some research was performed in Michigan and it affected about five helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was purely by accident because it was a communications research project. But what you need to do is develop, and it varies depending upon what's available. A, you have to have a parable dish. The, the tube itself, the cheapest tubes that are available, that are standard microwave, microwave tubes, run as little as $49. State-of-the-art, high output, high volume tubes are running about $99 to about $120. So that's nothing. We're talking the price of an SKS. Back that up with a high, high, yes, high storage capacitor. Oh, God, yeah. And then whatever power source you have, and it doesn't have to be shoulder fired because you don't really need shoulder fired. You just need something as a an air defense gun, so to speak. All right, the bigger sure. it is, the meaner it is. The range is almost unlimited, but let's assume that about half a mile to a mile you can still do some terrible things with electronic devices. Tell and us about the box of baggies you tell in one take. Come on now. A dollar box of baggies? These little sandals? Yes, okay, shoddy? yep, that's the other Come option. on. That's the poor man's, poor man's air defense weapon. Is that a Megatron or a Cybertron? Megatron. Now, uh, Tim, what we're going to do is uh, a mysterious set of prints will probably appear somewhere out of nowhere that nobody will take credit for and anybody can assemble. And that's something that will be yes, very straightforward. So if I find one laying on the ground, I'm going to sure. That's right, those copies. Now, this, now the, like, again, the bigger it is, and it can be nothing more than household current, 
but also assume you may lose that. You have to assume being able to make something that will work off generator packs. Um, the other area are lasers, but we won't get into that, but let's just say that that research has already been done. And whatever they have, we can make. We don't worry about it being state of the art, and it doesn't have to be pretty. Okay, Cyberdyne system. <laughs> now, by the way, that's that hypertech. Was those chips hypertech, yeah. Now, he just has brought something up. If you have a suspected LZ or landing zone for helicopters, nothing more than a 100 count box of baggies is enough to bring down any helicopter on the planet. Now, you simply take the 100 count peg box of baggies and spread them across the field. One baggie on one rotor is all it takes to destroy their lift. All it takes. Ever notice, if you ever watched anybody who was in the military remembers this, remember the guy, the crew chief, comes out, sits the fire extinguisher down, and goes all around the ground of the aircraft. He's not looking for anything that's on fire. He's making sure that he doesn't, he doesn't find anything that goes up here and all of a sudden they go down there. Anything that makes contact with the rotors, anything that will, will off balance any one of the rotors, is enough to bring the aircraft down loaded. And remember, they're going to be coming in heavy and hot, aren't they? <laughs> yes, fine copper wires. It doesn't have to be real big. That's another thing. Fine telephone wire, like single strips, can be stretched in long distances. And any of that, once it makes contact, it's not going to, it's not going to shred them to pieces. But you'd wish it was never there when it's locking around the rotor distributor and all, all the other, all of the, uh, tra the transmission. Anything will do. One of the oldest tricks that worked the best that was used during World War II when they did not have enough cannon to shoot down aircraft for the merchant marine ships going across the Atlantic. Torpedo bombers had to pass over the targets when they would drop their bombs and the dive bombers had to do the same thing. So they had barrage balloons and steel cables with, with nothing more than a CO2 or a cannon projector behind it with a steel rod. As the plane would commit itself to its flight path and helicopters would do the same thing, the steel rod would fire and it would be projected up to 300 yards into the air. The steel cable went up behind it and was attached to the ship. The helicopter comes into the steel cable and then follows the rest down. It worked the same with planes and it took down a lot of planes this way. So they do work. Remember, they're not flying tanks. And those that are flying tanks are still being held up by nothing more than rotary wings. Once they lose those, they're nothing but thud, thud puppies. They go down. <laughs> Very embarrassing when you got to clean everything up. When the, when the agenda has to do with whether or not this is a business or if this is a patriotic movement. Okay? This is not a business. The only reason that we use the tapes and stuff that we put together is as a weapon. I, the only way I looked at it was a double-edged dagger. Once I stuck it in, we could twist it left and right. We want copies made. I mean, it's like you know, you're bringing up the point about like Linda Thompson, Bo Greitz. Everybody's been doing a, these numbers. You've never heard me, and you won't hear me ever say anything against them, other than that they are wasting airspace. That's really the way to describe it. Think about this: How much time do you have when you buy an hour of, of airtime? Every minute you're busy backbiting one of your fellow patriots is another minute you've lost where you can stick that knife in the enemy's vitals and twist it there. And the enemy knows that That's and right. uses it. Division. That's division. So what are we going to expect here September 19th? Well, first of all, I disagree with the idea of doing that, but it's not. And I've been talking to Linda. We've been in communications on and off. Trust me, sometimes I talk three hours with Linda. Try hanging up. <laughs> no, she's actually. We've, everybody's got their. Everybody has their own their own way of doing things. Uh, but we've talked to Linda. We've talked to a lot of the other different patriot elements. What we're trying to do right now is get them to communicate, get them to interlock. We don't want a central organization, though. And the reason I say that is, and the best example of this is what happened with the Cuban resistance against Castro before the Bay of Pigs. What I said before is absolutely true, guys. They nickeled and dined Castro to death. He couldn't keep track of them all. He didn't know where they all were. They were taking chunks out of his party. They were taking people and pulling them away from the, from the central communist groups. They were losing ground left and right. Then the CIA stepped in and said, you, we got to have a big central pyramid. Everybody needs to come together. And then we're going to have an invasion. Well, it was a setup from the beginning. We all know sure they lost was. their air support. They lost their naval support. 
When they hit the beaches, all of the cargoes are intentionally mismarked. Boxes that said ammo were first aid gear. Equipment that was first aid gear was food. And these guys were dropped on the beach like this, busting crates open, trying to figure out what was what. That was no accident. They got rid of the Cuban resistance, and it took 20 years for them to even come, with, come up with anything that had any semblance of what they'd originally organized around. So they were literally, it was intentionally betrayed because they were Cuban nationalists. They were truly Cubans. They weren't inter I don't see where there's a centralization with her. With her well, no, it's not that, but that has to do with the problem. Okay, what the he problem is everybody from everywhere just to swarm. To converge, right. the problem with that is, first of all, we don't have to go anywhere to find an enemy. He's going to be sitting right in our own backyard. Two, the, that piece of real estate is on the other side. Uh, be quite honest, even if the Marine Corps didn't know or didn't know what's going on, the Marine Corps controls Washington, D.C., not the Army. And they are very, very loyal, if nothing else, and will follow orders blindly. Make no mistake about it, the Marines are very good for that. They're very good soldiers. Now, oh, I'm sorry. Now, the other consideration is this. The other consideration is this. I understand where Linda got the idea from. I've listened to most of the documentation and tapes having to do with the person and the people that she was speaking with. But I still think that the declaration was out of sync. We have to have hostilities in motion to create this declaration. There are arguments, and some people got right up in my face. Well, we had Ruby Creek, and then we had Waco. Ruby Creek was a devastating terror action. I will agree with that. But 89% of the people you talk to won't even know what you're talking about. So that 90% don't know, don't know about Waco, and it was much bigger. Right. I mean, that's the really sad thing. Well, they, they, they don't understand what the, what the meaning was, but at least they saw it. In other words, they saw it on TV. Okay. They don't know what it was about, but they knew it existed. What that but there were sex preverts, and they right. deserved what they got. But that was what, what I'm arguing is that that was our Lexington. For our, from our viewpoint, okay, at the end of the Revolutionary War, most people had no idea what was going on. You go 10 counties away from Lexington County, and they, all they saw was smoke off on the horizon. That was it. On the other hand, closer, they saw the smoke and knew it was a house burning. They knew it was a village that was on fire, and they came to their aid. That's the same situation we're in now. We've had our Lexington. The other foot has to drop. We all had, I mean, let's, let's be honest about this. And I can't stress this enough. And I'm embarrassed by my, by my own because we should have known better. Everybody here waited for them to come out of there, walk out of there, and the government was going to let them come out of there. We should have known better. They've always cleansed by fire. Historically, everything they've always been involved with. They've always burned the people out. They've always killed everybody they could to destroy all physical evidence. And what did they do here? It's for that reason that we can't let it happen again. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. But what one of the Davidians said, I have to agree with. They cannot change what happened. Those people are dead. But what the one guy said was this. I can't bring their lives back. The only thing I can hope is that, that what that did was created a wake-up call for the bodies that were, with the lives that were paid. The American people are in motion. And I think we all got to admit that's exactly what it did. We, we saw a big dose of it yesterday at the Reno. State House yep. with Reno. Well, the butcher of Waco, that's exactly what she is. In fact, when the trials come, she's a Heinrich Himmler, a Molotov, she's a Quisling, take your pick of terms, but she is definitely a criminal and she knows exactly what went on there. She knows that federal forces were directly involved. She knows that foreign forces were directly involved, and I think we can prove that uncontrovertibly un 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 now. It's just a matter of time because the money is going to disclose everything. And that's the bottom line. They still love their shekels. And while we can't get all the intelligence information, we can follow where the money was spent. And that's showing us what happened. It's taken a year plus now. Follow the money. Follow There's the money. That's right. What about the money chain? 